everybody. I'm Michael Munson with Forge, and I'm really happy that you're all here um, tonight to share in this experience. Um, just for access, I am a white appearing person with black t-shirt, a very loud paisley shirt, glasses, short hair, short beard. Um, I also wanted to just take a moment and acknowledge the land that we are all sitting on. I know we're in different parts of the country, and I know that different parts of the world are experiencing a lot of trauma to their land and to their people. So um, if we could just take a couple of seconds to acknowledge where we are in our world and what land we're occupying and send some good thoughts to the folks in Ukraine. Thank you. So tonight will be a relaxed discussion with some pre-arranged questions and probably some questions that pop out of, out of other places. So um, I'm really thrilled that um, Caitlin is here and Jasmine and Finn and Elise, who I'm not seeing on the screen right now, but who's probably gonna pop back on. And I'm hoping that maybe each of you could just do a very quick name, pronouns, agency, if you have one, um, like a one-liner, two-liner sentence just to get us get us rolling with who you are. Caitlin, do you want to start? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Caitlin Miles Weber. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, and I work for myself. My business is just Weber Therapy, LLC. Um, I used to work in a physical office, but now I do 100% telehealth ever since um, the office building that I was in was sold during COVID. And now I'm pretty happy doing 100% virtual. I also find that the accessibility is really, really nice for people. Um, I'm only licensed to see people who are located in the state of Wisconsin at this time. That may change a little bit in the future. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. You want to pick somebody else to go next? Oh, sure. Um, Jasmine. Hello, I'm Jasmine Lammers. I am uh, a transgender female. I work in Sherman Counseling out of an office in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Um, I also own my own business, Transformative Services, where I provide training and consultation services for gender diversity and DEI work, uh, which is for anywhere really in the state of Wisconsin. Um, my licensing is only for Wisconsin. Um, I do have the ability though to do telehealth, so see anyone within all of Wisconsin. Great. Thank you. You want to pick? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. Finn. Hi everyone, I'm Finn. Uh, they them, and um, I'm in private practice. My practice is called Milk Thistle Clinic. Um, I'm also licensed to work in Wisconsin, and um, currently am 100% telehealth as well. Cool. Thank you, Elise. I use she, her, and I'm also in private practice. My clinic is called Northwood Clinic. Um, I am having some connection issues. So like right now, everybody is frozen. I hope that you can all hear me. I'm going to keep my video off uh, unless I'm speaking so that uh, I can hope my connection. Thanks. Yeah, most of that came through. So um, I know sometimes if people want to log back out and log back in, that can sometimes help. But um, I'm sure that you are a pro at knowing what to do with, with troublesome internet. So if um, most people have heard now that, that all of you are in Wisconsin, and our discussion will probably be somewhat Wisconsin specific, but sometimes we'll just talk about things that are um, relevant to trans folks and non-binary folks and mental health. So let's go a little bit deeper maybe in our, our, your introductions. So I'm wondering if you could each share a little bit about what your primary modality or modalities are. So like CBT, DBT, and put those terms into some lay people's you know, language so that we don't have acronyms all over the place. Um, who wants to start? What kind of modalities? What do you do? How can you explain it? I can start. So, my modalities, um, 
I like to tell people that, you know, where I come from as a background, just so that they not only know my modalities, but also where a lot of my experience and understanding comes from. So I grew up in a very rural town in uh, Wisconsin. I am a Buddhist individual, but had heavy Christian influence in my upbringings. Um, I'm a married with children individual, uh, lesbian, polyamorous, uh, and yeah, that's, I guess, pretty good for now. Um, the things that I use to help my clientele is a lot of gender affirming type therapies, which is basically um, giving the client the ability to explore and understand themselves in this space to not pressure or to invalidate in any way. Um, I also really love existential therapy, which is dealing with a lot of the philosophical ideas um, I do a lot of psychoeducation, which deals with teaching individuals the background information regarding mental health, regarding um, how we think, how we act, how society thinks, how society acts. I try to um, get people aware of the societal stigmas and influences so that they can uh, resist hopefully internalizing them, helping them build the community they need for support, building up pride in themselves. Um, I have a lot of therapeutic model that I actually have made for myself. Um, I found that a lot of the therapeutic models that are in the psychological world are lacking in many ways. So um, I've spent many years uh, developing my own uh, therapeutic kind of model, if you will, that doesn't really fit in any um, particular ones that you would find, if you want to say commercially. Um, it's some of the ideas of it I do have in a YouTube channel of mine. If you look up Jasmine Lammers, um, you can find some of the basic ideas of my own personal model. Um, not all of them, but I once in a while remember to put some things in there. So if you would like to learn about like what I call the whole four horse people, the transitioning and things like that there. Um, right, you can find them there. Thank you. I can go next. Um, oh my gosh, Jasmine, I just got so excited like hearing that you have a YouTube channel. I'm gonna check it out. I wrote it down. Um, I, I really enjoyed meeting Jasmine. Um, we networked like I don't know, six months, nine months ago or something like that. So, um, so I am Caitlin, she, her again, and, um, I'm an ASEC certified sex therapist. Um, so that's like my primary, uh, specialty, if you will. And I'm a cisgender queer woman married, um, lesbian. Um, I'm also pansexual. I like to call myself both. <laughs> and, um, and I, I work a lot with people with specific sexual concerns. So whether they're coming in, you know, one, one of the coolest things is if they're coming in wanting to learn how to have an orgasm, um, or if someone is unhappy with the frequency of their sex life, the quality of their sex life. So I talk with people about quantity and quality of sex that they're having. Um, I help people recover from sexual trauma and recover a healthy sex life after trauma. Um, I do a lot of somatic experiencing to help people recover that. Um, so a lot of mindfulness and embodiment, a lot of wiggling your toes, feeling the air go in and out of your nostrils, really basic stuff. I help people embody a lot in sessions um, while we talk about a little bit about what happened, but it's not like I don't do EMDR and I don't do exposure therapy where you like have to go through every single detail and like, it's not hardcore like that. Um, we talk about what happened to the extent that it's therapeutic to you and we help ground you in your body during it. So, um, I think we, I'm doing too much details, but anyway, so, um, that's the certified sex therapist part. And I work with individuals and couples. I do ages 18 to 60 or so, give or take. Um, I'm very kink affirming. I'm sex work affirming and, um, LGBTQ specializing. Um, I try not to see very many cis white male folks because they're just not really my specialty. So I'm kind of like the inclusion clinic where I like to see people with an oppressive <laughs> identity, if you will. So, um, I like to see someone who's, um, I'm queer and I love to see people who are queer. I love to see people who are trans. I love to see people who are non-binary. I love to be 
see people who are, um, have intersectionality. So I just really like helping people, um, who have experienced oppressions in their lives. And I like being there for them and working with them. I find that I'm a much better therapist for them than for cis white head dudes. Sorry. Um, cool. yeah. <laughs> um, could you say what ASECT is? Some of us might not. Yeah, ASECT is um, the American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. So they're the governing body for um, lots of sex educators and therapists and counselors um, in America and also internationally. So first I got my master's and then I got a lot of continuing education and supervision and got certified by them. So thank you for describing Finn, Elise. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I have a pretty eclectic approach, which just means that um, I take pieces from different kinds of modalities and um, use them when they make sense, depending on the specific client and what, what they need at that time. Um, so, you know, I would say that with every client that I see, um, I do some systems work. So that just means exploring um, different aspects of identity and uh, identities through which we experience oppressive stories and, um, and stories about being in power and being um, empowered. And so there's a lot of systems work um, that I do with every client. I have a lot of folks that I do um, internal family systems work with. So that's about exploring the different parts of ourselves and some of the, the ways that we experience um, really complex emotions and complex stories about things going on in our lives. Um, I do a lot of narrative work. So again, that's, uh, those two tend to fit really well together. So narrative work is all about um, exploring stories, stories that we're carrying about what's going on, um, what's happening in our lives. And then a lot of times kind of reaching beyond the stories that, that are really comforting and maybe even familiar and, and using creativity to kind of expand and thicken some of those plots. Um, I do some EMDR work, um, that's primarily for folks who are, are coming in with some really specific needs around doing some trauma processing. Um, yeah, and I, I see, um, so my practice has been oriented towards working specifically with queer and trans folks, um, right now everybody who I see is queer. Um, I just I just spent some time looking over it today and two thirds of my clients are trans identified. Um, and then I also work with a lot of chronically ill and, and disabled folks um, and folks living at those intersections and then um, lots of people of color as well. So. Thank you. Elise, are you still connected with us? Elise is working on her tech issues. We're trying okay. to get her back online. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're gonna we can just move on a little bit and we can integrate Elise back in when when she's back here. Um, so I want to ask a question that which which does go against Forge's kind of alignment of things, but what do you like most about working with trans and non-binary clients? And why Forge doesn't believe in that kind of thing is like, you know, why should we divide the world into different groups of people? But, you know, if you work with trans people, and several of you have mentioned that you really like working with trans folks, what do you like most? Oh. Oh. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to, okay. I'm always the one who seems to jump in at first. Um, sorry about that. Uh, I really like working with uh people of all diversities, really. Um, I love alternative lifestyles. I love um, people with relationship diversity, um, uh, sexual diversity, uh, gender diversity. Really, I like the diverse individuals because they are individuals who are open to ideas. They are willing to think about things and they don't take my words for granted just 
as is. Um, in Buddhism, there's a big saying of, uh, when I point at the moon, don't look at my finger. It's this idea that my words aren't what matters. What matters is the idea my words are trying to help you find, um, don't fixate on the words. And I feel like people who are cis hetero, white male, Christian, blah, 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 blah. Individuals quite often have this fixation that they come in expecting that my words are gonna be magic and that they just need to memorize these words and it'll all be good. Um, I find a lot of people with diversity though, uh, because of their diversity, they've learned that you can't just take words. You gotta think ideas, think independently, um, see things how you wanna see them uh, and pick and choose what's there. I tend to tell most people, don't take what, everything I have to say because I'm going to be wrong somewhere. There's no way I can be right everywhere here. And so it's great to have those people willing to think independently, um, listen, give their own thoughts back, debate back and forth, willing and willing to treat me as a person rather than as some sort of superior God, which I really hate. Um, I'd rather be the person who is equal. And that's having peers in the room with me makes me more comfortable. It makes them more comfortable and it makes the conversation go so much nicer, I think. So that's my thoughts. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. We all don't have to, not we, you all don't have to answer every question. So would, would other folks like to? Yeah. I mean, I, I love working with trans and non-binary clients um, because I think um, I've given this a lot of thought recently, just cause like I went through a period in my life recently where I had, um, a loss, uh, and, and I, my like bullshit meter just went way down in my personal life. And so I had to really like reassess what clients I wanted to take on. Cause like that happens to therapists a lot, um, where you, you start to like therapists do this where they sometimes burn out. If you, in your personal life, things are rough. Right. So, I started to be really angry at the patriarchy and really, really angry at racism and really, really angry at homophobia and transphobia. And we live in this society that is so it's rooted in, in the patriarchy. And I think I just especially love working with non-binary and trans clients because they, they get it. And when I work with like people who are in positions of privilege, who don't understand their privilege, um, it's really, really, really frustrating as a therapist to like, have to educate someone when they're just not willing to learn. So it's sort of like what Jasmine was talking about, the openness that non-binary and trans folks have to learning and to being open. And, you know, they didn't get the privilege. They don't get the privilege to just be like, well, I don't have to learn this stuff. Like they have to learn this stuff. They have to be open to it, but, um, you know, so that's kind of why I like working with them just because I don't know, they're my people and I'm cis, but I just find that being part of the queer community, um, I align with them and it just feels like, like working with them just feels like home to me. So. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I really like this, this theme of, you know, getting creative and, and the creativity that comes from, you know, living, living in the sort of outside the, um, the dominant narrative of, of what our experience should be as humans. Um, so I really like that you both, you both said that. Um, I, I personally identify myself as trans and non-binary. Um, and I think, you know, something that I would would build on just for myself and, and what I really enjoy about it is um, there's something in this profession historically that uh, is built on this idea of, you know, a provider being outside of a, a specific community or coming from a place of, um, really privileged identity, highly resourced identity, and then coming into a community that is experiencing um, marginalization or experiencing a problem, which is <laughs> you know, quite pathologizing. Um, 
and, and is coming in to help. And I think that just, you know, from, from my experience, um, I think that's starting to change, right? I think some of that expectation and that, that really kind of dark side of what, what it means or the story there, um, that story of being a rescuer, some kind of savior, some kind of helper from the outside. Um, I think that's starting to break down and I can see that from, from inside the profession, but I really do think that that's still very new and um, I think it's amazing that, you know, we're starting to talk about these things and that uh, I, see, I see clients, not, not necessarily my own clients, but clients of all kinds, just talking about what it means to them to experience having a therapeutic relationship with someone who has gone through those things as well. And that there's, there's a leveling there, right? There's like a, there's something about having, um, you know, someone not necessarily on some kind of hierarchy above you, right? But having like a peer, someone who is your peer, someone who's in it, someone who's in um, trying to experience and embody liberation in life. And, um, and so I think of, of the work in that sense, when we're working within our communities as you know, really liberatory work. And that's what I love most about working with, with other queer folks. Thank you. Elise, I'm not sure if your internet is stable or not, but we were kind of talking about kind of what do you like about working with trans and non-binary folks? Um, what's your um, kind of emotional connection? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so please let me know if you can, if you cannot. Here, because I kind of am having. We're having a lot of problems hearing much of anything. It looks like we've lost Elise again. Okay, thank you, Shelly, for, um, piping in with that. Okay, we're gonna still hold the space open. The, the magical internet gurus are gonna hopefully help this process. Um, but if not, we will, we will continue on and um, bring it back later. Uh, so we all know both because a lot of us are within the community. Um, it looks like all of us are within the community. Um, we know what some of those barriers are that a lot of trans and non-binary folks face. And those barriers happen sometimes with us as providers, sometimes with other providers, um, but they can bring that into our therapeutic relationship with them. Um, what are your thoughts about how to work with that past trauma, that past either medical mental health trauma, the, I don't even wanna call it baggage because it's like the world's baggage, not that person's baggage. How do you deal with, with that coming into your office? Mm -hmm. Feel free to change that question to what works for you all. Uh, <laughs> I like this question and it also like just brings up so much, like it just like brings up the anger. I mean, like I feel my clients anger along with them a lot. My trans and non-binary clients and, and my cis queer clients too, who experience like homophobia, but, but my trans clients who experience transphobia, especially like when they're, I'll have clients come in who like saw another therapist and that therapist said something transphobic or, you know, a gender queer client will come in and, and their therapist said something really damaging to them, or they were denied access to medical care that they need or gatekeeping happened to them and they couldn't get the care that they need to have um, gender affirming procedures or surgery, you know, to just have top surgery or to have hormones or whatever they need. And it just infuriates me and sort of like Finn mentioned, it's getting better, I think, but it's still bad. Um, and you know, I just sit there and I validate the anger and we feel it. And <laughs> we have some like sessions of just like 
bitching about it and <laughs> feeling it and grounding and feeling it in our body and somatic experiencing it. And, um, and I'm looking back at the question. I'm getting mad. So many trans and numbers. Don't worry about the question. You're on target. Don't worry about the question what's on paper. Um, you're going there, right? How do you deal with what, what people are bringing in from other people's bad behavior? Um, so you've talked about it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. all I have to say right now. I just get really mad. And then I, I offer letter writing. I don't charge for letters. Like if somebody needs a letter to get hormones or to get top surgery or to get bottom surgery or whatever, um, I'll give them a letter within one session. I took a really great training by Abby Rolf. I think it's Abby Aldridge now who's in Florida. Um, they offered a fantastic training on, on gender affirming letter writing. Um, and so a client comes in and as long as they're not like in active psychosis or has like schizophrenic symptoms that are untreated or whatnot, I basically just give them an assessment. And if they need a letter, um, you know, I'll, I'll charge them on a sliding scale just for the session. Um, and then I don't charge for the letter. So, you know, I think that that's a really important, um, thing for people. And as soon as I have uh, a retirement fund, I plan to do all of it pro bono, but until then I have to charge for the session to write the letter. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts. Okay. <laughs> it's always interesting trying to see who, which of us jumps in next. Um, so yeah, I, I feel a lot of this. I mean, I grew up in a very much a very oppressive area. So I, I can very much empathize with some of the, the struggles that go through and I've had to struggle through the medical hurdles and gatekeeping and things like that myself. So it's nice that I can empathize with those things. Um, I also worked as a crisis counselor for uh, six years, crisis supervisor and got very good at helping people who have crisis and trauma, um, suicidal and things like that. So I'm able to help with uh, a lot of those baggages. Uh, I specialize in a lot of the uh, disorders as well that tend to come because a person has trauma, things like uh, BPD, uh, dissociative disorders, and a lot of things like that, PTSD and that. So it's a lot of the people I see usually do have some sort of trauma-based uh, struggles that is either diagnosable or undiagnosable. I actually tend to say it's, it, it's sad to say because of our society does this to us, but quite often if you find someone who's gender diverse, you find someone who probably has trauma and it's just, that's just part of what I try to validate that it's not it's not us that are traumatizing ourselves. It's the society that's traumatizing uh, us as we're trying to just be ourselves. Um, I found that it, it's really hard for clients to be able to advocate for themselves in a lot of scenarios. Um, this is actually why I created Transformative Services. It was so that there was a platform that they could direct uh, employers to, schools to, hospitals to, um, family to, doesn't matter. Uh, it's so that they can come and get their education, their training, their consultation, and it doesn't have to rely on the individual. Um, how many people act, you know, how many businesses or hospitals of that actually reach out is another thing, but at least um, the client doesn't have to feel the full burden of providing all this that I'm just telling them how to advocate for themselves and they just go do it, I can uh, jump platforms and help them in another avenue as well. I find that to be very um, helpful and affirming, especially since a lot of clients don't have as much stubbornness as I do. Um, so, uh, but I have worked with pretty much any sort of meeting you think. I've worked with many businesses, Kohler and Aurora and uh, school systems and counties and stuff. So I'm getting pretty good at it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah um i you know i've been there it's it happens um and yeah i think you know the way that i tend to approach working with that 
in terms of the therapeutic relationship that I'm building with a client having come from that experience is, you know, we start with transparency. Um, so one of the first things that I, that I always ask someone when I'm seeing someone new is, you know, have you been to therapy before? How did it go? Um, and as much as people feel comfortable sharing, you know, I like to, to process that right away as much as possible so that, um, so that it's out in the open and that I know what, what's going on um, and that we're naming it right away. You know? and, and I find a lot of times um, when I have a trans client coming to my practice to work with me, um, part of the reason that they have chosen me as a trans therapist myself is because you know, there's some understanding that that's not gonna be repeated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Elise if you're here um, and want to pipe in. Yeah, I can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that the trauma that is specific to um, mistreatment by professionals um, is really specific. I mean, the, the way that it impacts trans and non-binary folks and queer folks, cis queer folks, um, is something like like everybody saying that kind of has to be handled at the beginning of a therapeutic relationship, and it doesn't. You know, I I don't. I think some people um, have the. Idea experience of thinking that like they're going to go to therapy and the therapist is going to tell them what is wrong and what needs to be fixed, which is not how I understand it to work at all. Um, and so I want to be clear that I don't, if a client doesn't want to talk about medical mistreatment, then we don't have to at all. Um, but I do, like Finn said, feel that it's really important that I at least know about it um, to the extent that they can share. Um, one thing that I am always advocating for is seeking out other professionals as well. So body work, um, um, you know, tarot reading, any, any other, uh, practitioner that a person can build a trusting relationship with, um, I think really does a lot for, setting new patterns and creating new experiences in terms of building that trust. Excellent. Thank you. You know, I think when I was listening to all of you talk about different aspects of this, um, you all brought up trauma. Um, you all brought up intersectionality in some ways. Um, and I'm wondering for folks, what do you think about how folks are bringing themselves into your offices, knowing that so many folks have trauma and folks that have trauma often want to have their own agency and control and may not want to be coming forward with pieces of data that may be useful in helping that therapeutic relationship for both sides. Um, how, how do you work with folks that have such, you know, such deep trauma that they, they feel fearful or just mistrusting of, of you at the beginning of your relationship? Um, you got to meet people where they're at. You just do. So um, I learned early on in my training to become a therapist that if you're, if you're running into a brick wall with a client, like you don't just keep hitting the brick wall. Right. So, um, you know, and that clients are not just made of bricks. Right. But we, we fortify ourselves as people with trauma with like bricks all around us. Um, and so those are really protective, right? So those are there for a reason. So when they're ready, they're going to dismantle them. And if we are the right person, if we have shown that we're worthy of, the, of that and that we're the right therapist, um, maybe this person will take those down and be seen by us or um, let that trauma be shared. But, you know, it's not our place to just like force them to share trauma with us. And I always, always, always say to people, 
your trauma, like it's sort of like, remember the me too movement. Um, no one owes you their story. You know, you know, I'm a trauma survivor myself and I don't owe anybody my story. So like, if I want to share my story with somebody, that's my choice. And like, that's, they're honored to have it, but including clients, the client therapist relationship is the same way. Like they don't owe me their story or stories. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to be really explicit about the fact that there's, I mean, there's just no end to the work that you can do in therapy story or a specific interaction or life is not somebody wants to cover in therapy there's um right way or right amount to share or just anything like that right so i guess i i the idea that somebody um wouldn't want to share and that that would be a problem just to, just really with me Thank you. I um, <clears throat> I believe in the idea of the three languages, three languages being words, tone, and body. Um, even if a client doesn't want to talk, they still convey information. And I tend to be very, um, I tend to work off of the body language more than anything. And I like to do a lot of psychoeducation a lot of psychoeducation focused specifically on queer, queer identities, um, and also societal stigmatization. So that's kind of if a client, a client, I can't fix anybody. I can only help someone fix themselves. Really, the work ultimately does get done by the client. I'm just there as an assistant, a guide, um, a, whatever you want to call it, but I'm not actually the one doing the fixing, just the one who's potentially giving tools for the fixing. And so that's kind of what I focus on if the person doesn't want to talk. I give them tools, talk about the various ideas and ways to see it and to think about it. And quite often you can tell what interests a person by their body language, if they're sitting forward, if they're listening closely, if they're kind of zoning out and looking away. And I can gear my directions based off of that. And usually a person eventually starts asking questions because you hit the things that are interesting, they're gonna to wanna to know more. And it, it builds the whole thing. I don't need to know a person's story to help them. And they have no need to give me a story for me to help them. If they want me to know the story, better focus how I help them, that's their right. But I feel like I still have the full capability of helping someone even without a story being present. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I really like what, what everyone has said so far. And um, I think so much of, you know, the ways that, that folks come in sort of thinking about this is like there's the expectation to share all of the trauma and to share it right away. Um, and that's just not, it's just not how uh, trauma works, right? Because any of us who have survived trauma know that so much of um, the aftermath of that is feeling out safety, right? And so what I, what I do when I'm, you know, working with someone that I can sort of pick up on, okay, this person's really, really feeling out if this is a safe space to, to say this thing is, I just do what I can to, to build that sense of safety, you know, and to help that person access a, a space of safety internally too. Um, so I work a lot towards, you know, especially like when I'm using EMDR tools and things like that, um, a lot of the approach is actually building up and strengthening um, the internal safety for that person so that, um, so that they can share it. Thank you. So a couple of you have mentioned um, 
a couple of points around gatekeeping. And um, we were just talking about like, you know, how much does somebody share? How much do they need to share? And, you know, I think our older school models of the WPAS standards of care and some other standards of care really focused on people needing to spill their guts basically before somebody would write a letter or do something affirming or help them change their name or whatever those things are that people want to do. Um, so I'm wondering if any of you have your own internal like standards of care. Caitlin, you mentioned like if somebody's exhibiting, you know, really strong dissociative or um, psychotic, I've, I've just messed up what you said, but something that's really maybe inhibiting somebody from making a decision. Um, so I'm wondering if folks have a model of care that they follow, what your process is. I mean, Caitlin, you already mentioned about where your point is of letter writing anywhere you want to go with that kind of question? Um, when it comes to helping clients gain what they need to, to feel affirmed and whole in their life, I really do believe in the informed consent model, the idea that I am here not to make a decision for a client. In fact, if a client's coming in to be assessed for a letter specifically, I tell them up front, this is not I am not going to make the decision for you. The, uh, really, I'm just looking for four things. Uh, if I'm able to say you have gender dysphoria so that the insurance companies will accept this, which is pretty much a given if you're already sitting there. Um, if you have the ability to give informed consent, which is basically checking to see if you're your own guardian. Um, if you understand what you're asking for and if you thought about it more than just today. Um, most people, most older school therapists had this, this, I don't know, months, or it's really kind of crazy because it was for the therapist, not for the client. The client already sat around for years thinking about this most of the time. And then they come in and they got to do another six months with the therapist just because they haven't, the therapist hasn't thought about it with the client. And that, that seems to be just wrong in my book. Um, I have to just check to make sure that the person doesn't have holes in their knowledge, holes in their information. That's my job there. My job is to make sure they have all the information informed in order for them to give their consent. Um, and if at, I tend to say, I'm looking for only one of three answers at the end of this conversation. Yes, please help me. No, I think I reconsidered or can we set up another appointment? I'm not sure. And I'm gonna continue through with any one of those three, as long as you are your own guardian. and capable of giving that informed consent. And um, I don't waste time. Once all the information is reviewed, then I check in with the person. Um, and this includes things for letters for helping get name changes or letters to help getting the gender changed on your driver's license or um, letters for medical services or, or whatever other support you're asking from me. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I um, I agree. The con the informed consent model is is the model that you know, if it were up to me, would would prevail. And um, the tricky piece is that you know most of the time when I am writing a letter for someone, it is you know needing to be the W path meeting the W path standards, and so. Um, what I do is, you know, I usually start with really making that delineation with, with who I'm working with and letting them know that, you know, I don't think that you need me to make this decision. Um, I know that you already know what you want because otherwise you wouldn't have asked me. Um, and um, I, like I approach therapy in general, um, it's a very collaborative project. So, um, I like to let people know like what the W path standards are about and what that standard is asking me to do. Um, because I think that for me, that does feel like part of the informed um, piece of informed consent is that I want people to know what the institutions are actually doing and the way that the institution is functioning. Um, and that we can, you know, once that person has an understanding of that, then we can kind of collaborate in a sense of generating a letter and coming up with language. Um, and I ask people to participate actively with me in writing the letter and reviewing it before 
before I sign off and send it off. That's great. Thank you. Other thoughts on this kind of complicated gatekeeping informed consent? How do we work with insurance companies that are in the dark ages? Um, oftentimes. Um, I just like agree with um, what Finn and Jasmine said. And I would love to see a day when gatekeeping is completely eradicated and doctors don't rely on therapists at all for this because like what other medical procedure is there that a therapist oh i know i went through fertility treatments and as a um as a queer woman we had to have someone sign off to say that yeah you can do this so i know that's the other one <laughs> Um, but anyway, so if you're a queer person going through fertility treatments and if you're trans or non-binary trying to get surgery, then you need to have mental health professionals sign off on it. But otherwise, what other medical treatments need to have like mental health professionals sign off on it? Like what the fuck? Right. So eventually informed consent all the way. Cool. Excellent. And that's what I thought all of you would say. Um, I don't know if Elise is still here or not, but. Um, yeah, I, I can only echo what has been said. I feel like, um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yes. we can all just go, yeah, <laughs> right, we get it. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about intersectionality. And um, that's a word that's, you know, it's a catchword, And, you know, we all have, I think, different interpretations of what that means or how that plays out for us. But, you know, we, we I've heard you all talk about trauma. I've heard you all talk about different people bringing in different parts of themselves into, into the space with you. Um, how do some of those intersections affect the work that you do with clients, whether it's about bringing intersections of race or age or class or disability or religion or, 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 or lots of those things. So how do those identities blend and work? And I, you know, again, Take this question where you want it to go based on what your experiences are. And that was a rambling question, I'm sorry. I can, I can start this time. Um, you know, I think I'm glad for this question um, because I, I think so much of the work just in the, the work that I do um, with that systems approach that I mentioned so much of that work is, is really oriented towards working with intersections of, of identity um, and folks living at those intersections. And so, yeah, there's so much of, um, you know, there's, there's like such a limitation too that I'm just thinking about now around even like the frameworks that we use to talk about what's happening in a therapeutic space, you know, even when we talk about modalities. Um, some of that, yes, is great for informing that, but there are also things that, you know, that so much of what I bring to the therapeutic space is also not even taken from that book at all, right? It's, it's anti-capitalist, it's anti-oppressive, it's anti-racist, um, it's decolonizing the therapy. And so there's so much of like other stuff that's happening in that space um, to work with what that means. and. And you know, how do we live in these spaces and, and go beyond you know, what those modalities also have to offer, right? Because a lot of those modalities um, are not about, again, liberation. I keep saying liberation, but they're not about liberation, right? They're not about embodying liberation. They're not about embodying um, anything beyond just kind of surviving and learning to accept the way that things are. And so, um, yeah, I think there's, there's limitations with the modalities, but then you can bring in all these other pieces of, you know, the work that's actually happening in the movements and the movements that we're in that um, can take us that step further. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I love what you said, Finn. And, um, just fills me with like warmth what you said and it's like really well put um and like here in Milwaukee I mean I'm I technically live in Glendale but we're like a block from Milwaukee and I love my city I love Milwaukee and Milwaukee also has a lot of um I mean 
I think it's still considered the most segregated city like in the US and a um, lot of violence towards people of color, like just very systemic racist practices here. Um, really difficult place to live for a person of color, especially for a black person. Um, and so people who are trans and a person of color, that intersectionality is always really intense, especially for people who I see who live here locally or anywhere in Wisconsin. Um, it's hard to be black in Milwaukee. It's hard to be black anywhere in Wisconsin. So, um, yeah. So what I was going to say about that is that we, oh, it's an extremely, the black community also in Milwaukee is very, um, homophobic and transphobic. And that I think is because the black community also already deals with so much bullshit and so much oppression that the families are like, we can't also be trans. Like you can't also be gay. Like you, you have enough otherness on you, honey, that I can't have you also be a trans kid. Like I need you to be straight. You know what I mean? So I think these parents are saying to their kids, no, honey, like you need to not have one more otherness identity on you. I think that sometimes is what's unfortunately happening. So it just breaks my heart when sometimes these young, um, or not so young, whatever, but, um, trans and non-binary kiddos and adults are coming in and they've been told not to be so for their entire lives and their person of color. So we talk about that intersectionality in my practice. So, um, I'm a really racial justice focused person and, um, I make sure to try to weed out people who don't believe black lives matter. Cause that's just not the people who I want to work with in my practice. Um, and also like ableism and, um, I mean, we could talk about intersectionalities till the cows come home. There's about 100 million different possible intersections. So, yeah, there are. <laughs> Um, yeah, intersectionality, I believe, is such an important topic, actually. It's, it's, it, there, you can't look at a person single dimensionally. It, there are so many different pieces, um, not just minorities, but privileges and a mix of both. Um, I, some of my upcoming trainings I'm doing actually are focusing specifically on intersectionality when they get me to pick what I can do for training, such as a seminar or something like that, then I uh, quite often do push towards that intersectionality training because that we all hear the 101 trainings of the individual identities, but I feel like we need to take that step up and start mixing to be able to understand better. Um, that's something I try and impart on the new counselors coming out. I do um, teach at Lakeland University multiculturalism to upcoming counselors. And this is something I try and press on them as well, that we don't look at this enough. We're uh, all of this counseling stuff, like was said earlier, you know, is very European, white, male, Christian centered, and it's very not good for people outside this really straight and narrow idea structure. Um, and so, you know, the, a lot of people don't think of me as someone who would understand intersectionality too much just because I'm a white, able-bodied, middle-aged, higher class individual, but it, there's a lot of hidden things for me too. Um, I'm actually intersex. I have, you know, sexual identity that's of uh, not normal. Um, I'm trans, I'm Buddhist. I um, actually am Fear, pretty decently physically disabled just because I have severe osteoporosis. I usually have some sort of bone broken most months just because of accidentally breaking them. So it's like, it's something that is dear to my heart too, just because not only is it necessary to understand me by mixing it all together, but you know, it's a lot of it is not seen there. And so I tend to focus very heavily on this idea of what is it that you all struggle with and how does it compound itself? How does it build on itself? How does it make the world? And that I think it's our job as practitioners to go to the sources of the minorities that um, we don't personally experience and listen to them and take their, take their story and not alter it. I mean, I can't 
speak on behalf of someone of a racial minority because I am of the racial majority um, it, of a privileged race, but I can speak their words if they're not present to speak on their behalf. And I will listen to someone who is there in my office who is of the racial minority. And if they tell me this is how it is for them, then that's how it is. It's, it, I can't debate that one because I have no experience to capable of even getting close to understanding that. So I think it's important to understand all that. Thank you. Elise, I want to make sure that you can step in if you'd like to. Thanks. Yeah, I, I've been thinking as I'm listening about the ways in which um, talking about intersectionality in therapy can make space for people to not necessarily shift identity, but um, embrace parts of or honor parts of an identity um, that have maybe been silenced or hidden because of the way that um, systems of oppression work, right? And want uh, things to be just kind of like wrapped up in specific kinds of packages. So to be able to say, um, I, I am this and I am also this and they're not separate, right? Um, is, is challenging sometimes. I mean, it's lovely and wonderful and whatever, but it's also really challenging sometimes if you've spent the majority of your life denying part of it, right? And so I think that, um, I guess I also worry that uh, sometimes when we talk about intersectionality in a professional way, it starts to feel so um, distanced from real life or from real identity struggles, right? Um, and so to, for me, I feel like it's important to be mindful of that and to not, kind of like what Jasmine's saying, like not think that it's my job to educate somebody about like, oh, well, this must be happening because you uh, were working class growing up, right? Like, <laughs> like I don't, I don't know. And I don't need to label anything for somebody, right? Um, um, and so whether we call it intersectionality in session or not, I think the awareness of the overlaps, right, is, is um, powerful. It gets, gets us a better understanding of the whole person. Excellent. Thank you. And I think that's kind of the root of this question, right? Is that, you know, it, the word doesn't mean a whole lot. I mean, the concepts mean a lot. What people's experiences are mean a lot. What their identities are mean a lot. But calling it intersectionality is, you know, a nice fancy word, but that's not really relevant for people's lives. Um, let's shift gears a little bit. And, um, you know, we've talked about trauma. And um, I know sometimes I reference and say, like, I don't know a trans person that hasn't experienced trauma. Um, and the same would be true for, I don't know a trans person who hasn't experienced depression or anxiety. Um, and I'm not sure if that's true for all of us, but I think that's that's true for a lot of us and what we experience. And folks that are dealing with trauma and depression and anxiety may use tools that they have in their toolbox of coping that some other people may not agree with um, or think is healthy. So things like cutting or using alcohol or, or engaging in risks that some other people may not think are appropriate. I'm wondering how in your practice in practices, how you work with clients who may be engaging in behaviors that could be potentially harmful, but is what they know how to do to keep themselves safe and alive or safer and alive. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I guess I'll start this one just, um, I, I totally understand why people would do those things. Um, I'm not ashamed of telling anyone that I've had struggles and that I've used coping skills that the mainstream society would probably frown upon. I was, there was a good about three, four years of my life that wasn't a single day that I was sober. I was using some sort of drug or alcohol to try to numb all the pain. Um, I've been a cutter. Uh, 
one of my partners is very uh, act, still actively cuts fairly regularly and uses alcohol on a daily basis to cope. Uh, I don't look down upon her for that. Another one, another partner of mine restricts their eating to keep them try and feel some control. And it's trying, you know, that's not something that is shameful. That is something somebody who feels that their life is out of control, trying to find some semblance of control. I look at it not as telling a person you're doing something bad, you're doing something wrong. I actually don't like those words, good, bad, right, wrong. This is all subjective. It all depends on which perspective you're using. And then words change depending on that perspective. So I don't like using those labels. I like the idea of is this a coping skill that you wish to continue all your life? Do you feel that it is healthy for you? Or do you feel that this is one that you would like to replace eventually? And that's kind of the idea. Use it as you will now. It, I will, I, unless the person has been cutting straight to the bone, I would never try and shame or look down on a person for cutting or punish them. The, I'm, the only reason I would try and, if you want to say punish in quotes, would be that if they are cutting to the bone, then there's something there is needing more direct immediate intervention, of course, but as that's such a rare, I've had only one of those individuals in my entire life, even in crisis days. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's something that we talk about that's healthy to think about that it's, yeah, it's a coping mechanism and we will hopefully eventually replace it. But until you do, um, I've had a client show up drunk to session uh, recently and was so scared to tell me that, so scared to thinking that they were gonna get kicked out of session because they they were told many times, you know, you can't show up to session drunk. And I was like, well, it's not gonna be a pr as productive session anymore. If you want to cancel right now and come back sober next time you can, but I have no problem sitting here talking with you because I'm not gonna punish you for using. In fact, if you're drinking and you're coming to session drunk, then I think this is probably a much more needed session than the ones you came to sober. So I don't like punishing and it's, it's so wrong in my book. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Other thoughts on this kind of harm reduction, knowing that people are engaging in coping strategies that, that may not be in their best interest for the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, what, feels really important to me in these situations is thinking about uh, the role of insight in function and dysfunction, right? And, and if we know, right, if we have the insight, like Jasmine is saying, that this is a behavior we would like to change, we're just not going to today, right? It's not the priority. If we can say that, then I feel like we're on the right, um, I don't wanna say right, but we're in a functional place, right? We, we're acknowledging that this behavior is not one we like or one that we wanna continue forever. And we're also setting a priority. Today, I'm not working on it. Um, which is kind of how everything has to go in therapy. You can't, or in life rather, right? Like you can't do it all at once. Sometimes you don't eat lunch and you wish you had, <laughs> right? And you don't have to like cancel your whole day because of it. It just goes that way sometimes. Um, and I guess the, the one that the importance to me of using insight as, as a gauge in session in the therapeutic relationship is that assessment of risk, right? If someone is engaging in objectively risky behaviors, right? Like things that could cause them death um, and they don't know it, they don't acknowledge that it is risky. That's something that, that I need to work on with them, right? If they know it's risky and they're not interested in changing it, then that's something that I need to be transparent about with them and that's all. Thank you. And that does bring up a little bit, and I, you know, I'm going to make space, obviously, for, for Finn and, and Kaylin, but, you know, kind of the whole role of mandatory reporting and, you know, how that plays a role sometimes when people are engaging in behaviors that might harm themselves in a, in a substantial way or harm others. Um, so just, you know, that piece is like another, I guess, complicating factor. Like we can look at somebody for what they're doing and what they need to do for the moment. 
but if somebody is constantly driving drunk is where is our responsibility to bring it up if not do something additionally to that but that's a different track so finn caitlin do you want to share any of your thoughts on yeah um you know i think it's this is where um you know i end up doing doing a lot of internal family systems work um, and i find that to be a really useful set of tools for you know exploring those parts of ourselves that that we all have that you know want to bring us to a place of um you know coming close to to death or close to nothingness or close to not existing, which, which all of those things I tend to think about as, you know, ending pain, right? Ending suffering. Um, we all want an out. Nobody likes pain, you know, we're, we're humans and we don't like pain. So um, yeah, I think we all have parts of ourselves that, that want to bring us to those places sometimes. Um, and so I've used a lot of IFS work to kind of explore those parts and, and work with some of the burdens that those parts are carrying and, and the kind of legacies and, and the oppression that we've internalized and that those parts are carrying. Um, and the other thing that I do um, in terms of approaching like safety planning um, I have a couple of tools that I use from the Icarus project, um, which for folks who are not familiar, is a group of folks uh, a while back doing some kind of grassroots anti-psychiatry um, movement towards, towards building like community support and using the networks that people already have and the resources that people already have to give um, both kind of alternatives to things like going to the hospital. Um, again, it's getting more creative about the options. Um, while we often like have this awareness that those spaces are not safe for those of us who, who are living in these intersections of identity and um, that that can bring even more trauma. So yeah like to get, get creative with people and use those tools to just help people think through what other options there are. Thank you. Yeah, I think I would just add, I love what everyone has said and um, I'm a huge fan of the harm reduction, um, the harm reduction model. And I have a really high tolerance for suicidality in my practice and in my clients, I think, that, you know, working with queer folks and with um, trans folks and non-binary folks has probably, um, I don't know if it was chicken or the egg, I'm not sure, like whether I already had a high tolerance for suicidality or whether, you know, what, what came first. But, um, but I, I think that people, exactly what Finn was saying, like people oftentimes think of it more than we talk about it in our daily culture, you know, um, it doesn't mean that you're going to act on it. So I tolerate the thoughts. I help people discuss, like do the existential therapy and talk about what that means. Um, I screen very thoroughly for what this means, like intent versus, you know, passive ideation. Those are very different things. Um, sort of a repeat track in your head, versus like a plan of what you're going to do are extremely different things. So I, I help clients differentiate what's going on for them. I never shame clients for, well, anything, um, you know, risky sexual behavior or um, drugs or alcohol or cutting or whatever the behavior is, you know, shame never, ever, ever helps anything. So I'm an anti-shame <laughs> therapist. Um, I do a lot of motivational interviewing. So it's like, that's sort of the circle of it, which relapse is part of recovery on that. So you might be thinking about changing your behaviors for a really long time before you ever change your behaviors. Um, and that's okay. You know, so just figure out where you're at, meet clients with, with where they're at. That's what I do. Um, you know, I, 
I have a loved one who smokes, I don't know, two packs of cigarettes a day, but is on, uh, instead of heroin is now taking, um, Spoxone. And I'm like, yay, awesome. You know, harm reduction, <laughs> you know, are you going to get lung cancer? Likely, but harm reduction. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Excellent. Not perfect about the lung cancer, but yeah. perfect <laughs> answers, right? um, and I love that line about like shame never helps anything. And it's cause it's true. Right. I mean, like, you know, I mean, we could say, stuff to people and it's not going to change their behaviors and it's just not going to help them feel any better or make different choices if they would like to make those different choices. Mm -hmm. Um, I would love it if we could switch to a couple of questions that have come in, encourage folks to ask some more questions, and then we can come back around and um, if each of you can share a little bit like kind of a wrap up, um, that would be cool. Um, Shelly, are you tracking questions? Yeah, I'd be happy to share a couple questions that we have. Um, So one question is, uh, the first time you meet with a client, um, what is it that you want to learn from them? Well, first thing I would want to learn from them um, is what is it they want from me? I don't want to talk to a client about something they don't feel is a problem or that they don't feel needs to be changed or that is just not, you know, there. And even if it is something that is disruptive to their life or extremely distressful, uh, if it's something they don't want to focus on, I don't necessarily focus on it because again, I'm not the one doing, doing the work if they aren't willing to focus on it, how, how would anybody make a change? And it's not my life. I don't make the decisions for other people's lives. So what they consider distressful or they consider wrong or right is what goes. So I really want to know what is it that you want? I mean, I, I also specialize in teens. A lot. I see a lot of youth. Uh, I've seen as young as five uh, in regards to trans individuals. And Quite often with the kids, especially the teens, the preteens, the parents will come in and tell me what they think needs to happen. I say, great, that's, I, you know, listen to them and everything. But then I always ask to talk to the kids one-on-one. And then I always ask the kid, what is it that you want to work on? I've heard what mom thinks the problem is, but what do you think? Because I want to help you, not mom. Um, So it's... It's very much one of those ideas that you need to focus on whatever the client wants. And so you have to ask that right off the bat. What do you want? What do you, what do you need my help for? What, what should we focus on? Thanks. Other folks want to pipe in with this question? I, I Sorry, start, yes. That's okay, yeah. I start that way too. I, I ask for a top three in the initial phone consultation that I have with someone before we start working together. And then I ask for a top three in the first session as well. And then we um, sometimes talk about uh, whether those three priorities have changed between the phone session and the first session. Um, Sometimes the three priorities have changed and we don't talk about it and that's fine too. Um, Yeah, that's really all. I want to know. And sometimes people don't have three and that's fine too. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, it's, it really depends, I guess. I mean, if, if a couple's coming in, I have a pretty structured start. Like I ask, what are your partner's top complaints about you? So if Jack and Jill are coming in, I ask Jack, what are Jill's top complaints about you? And, um, vice versa. So anyway, I have a pretty structured start to couples therapy. And then if it's, um, and then we get into more informal stuff as well, but there's a method to my madness with couples therapy. It's very different from individual therapy. And then individual therapy. Um, I talk about, um, I talk about like what's, yeah, exactly what's bringing you in and, um, history of the presenting problem. And we talk, usually we talk a little bit about your parents and how they fucked you up and all that stuff. So if they're, if they're okay with talking about that right away. 
And you probably ask them in that same same language, right? You know, what, yeah, you know, which is oh, like, I, you know, that's got to be helpful, right? To your glasses, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> you up, so. yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, um, I also, I can't remember if I, I mentioned earlier, but um, I also see some couples. So I have a different approach when I'm seeing couples, but um, it's a little, it's a little more structured, but I like to, you know, it, it sort of depends, I would say on like what that person's experience is coming in, because I do have some clients that, you know, I'm their first therapist that they've ever seen. And so with someone like that, I like to make a lot of space for that person to ask questions if they have them. Um, sometimes people wanna know things about me. So I try to make space for that and, and give some space for some curiosity there. Um, if there are things that people need to know about me to, to get comfortable. Um, and then, you know, sometimes again, like in that same sort of vein, there's, there's things about the process of therapy that sometimes people need, uh, need some support, just kind of getting a sense of how that works. Um, yeah, mostly I see it, I see the first session as uh, getting to know each other and just feeling out if, if the relationship is going to be supportive for them. Excellent. Thank you. Shelley, what's question two? Yes, we have a question about um, autism and gender identity. And the question is, um, do you find there's a correlation between autism and being transgender? Um, as someone who is both, I find that there are additional struggles when communicating with fellow trans people. Um, I I actually do like this question just because it is one of those interesting um, and hidden places. It's that really stems from some of the research from over the seas that came in that says that it depends on which research that I've seen as low as 7%, I've seen as high as 18%. Um, more likely if a person has an autism diagnosis that they would also have a gender dysphoria diagnosis. Um, I personally, and, and many I've talked to about this research have agreed that it's not that autism causes gender dysphoria or vice versa. It's that a person who um, does have an autism, autism spectrum disorder will be less susceptible to cultural norms. They are less susceptible to conforming to how culture believes conformity should look. And so they tend to be a lot more individualistic and capable of, ex of expressing what they feel versus what everybody's telling them they should feel. Um, truthfully, I do have um, an autism diagnosis too. I know. I have everything it sounds like, doesn't it? Um, I sometimes wonder how I can even function in society sometimes. But um, I, it, it's a struggle sometimes. It's ever since I got that, it's one of those things, it's a relief, but it's also one of those, well, people can't understand, it seems. Um, I, I particularly like some other research that I've seen that says that a therapist who has autism actually has roughly about a 10% increase in success rate of helping their, the people that they help. Um, and I believe it's because that I don't really play the social politic games. I get right to business. Um, and it's, I think, a very important kind of idea structure there. It is something that we have to remember, though, too, because uh, individuals who do have these struggles in their life, they they do speak pretty directly, and they don't they do forget to express certain things that, in their viewpoint, seems like should be given, and so they do get misunderstood, and they do get shut out, and they because they're not explaining in social normal ways then they often don't get as much access uh, as they should be getting in things. And I do have a lot of clients coming to me saying that they're very 
frustrated because they have an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis and they're trying to get their gender dysphoria um, needs met and they're having trouble left and right because nobody's willing to to take their word that they understand themselves. Um, I personally think that someone normally who has autism understands themselves better, not worse, but that's maybe um, my own personal bias there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, other folks have comments on this? Again, you know, we don't all have to answer. If you, if you have thoughts, that would be great to hear. Um, I guess I, thanks Jasmine, I, that's also my understanding of the research that, that exists. Um, and yeah, I can say, uh, I certainly have some clients at the intersection of those identities. Um, and I'm not sure in terms of the, the piece about communicating with trans folks, I guess, there's an assumption that I'm making that there's a question there about, um, about communicating with trans folks who are not on the spectrum um, or don't experience some kind of neurodivergence. And so I'm not sure if this question is, um, is asking about like social interactions just in a sense of in the community or in a, a therapeutic space. Um, but I think something that it's, that it's bringing up for me is, you know, some of the, the barriers to connection that we can experience within our own communities. Um, and I think this, this sort of brings back the intersectional piece that a lot of us living um, at the intersections of of various identities that have experienced marginalization um, carry our trauma in ways that that keep us from connecting, um, and it make it it makes it harder to connect and to understand each other. Um, makes it harder to trust each other, and so I think that might be what what is coming up here, and it's just coming up for me hearing this question. Um, I'm not sure if that's what, what the person is asking. Thank you. I'm very aware of our time. Do you, do, does anybody else, Caitlin or, or at least wanna share thoughts? No, that was really thorough. Why don't we do a round robin of, um, what do you think some ways are that you foster resilience in your clients? If Elise is still, still here, can we start with you? Because I want to make sure that you um, you get in. So what are some ways that you foster resilience in your clients? Yeah, I am still here. I think um, I do a lot of affirming. And I think when I'm thinking about this question, I'm thinking about uh, kind of affirming resilience that I see. So. I think when I hear foster resilience, it almost feels like I'm, I have a hand in creating it, which is never how it has felt to me. Um, I do think that as a witness to my clients, I can see things that they sometimes miss because they're very busy seeing so much of their lives and I only see an hour of it a week, right? Um, and so to be able to say like, wow, that was really badass of you or that took a lot of guts, you know, um, I have noticed that that kind of witnessing can help people to recognize things about themselves that they maybe would have skimmed over. Thank you. And thank you for the, the comment about my questions wording, because I, I am going to change that if I ever use it again. Thank you. So what are some ways, I'm gonna to try to just say this without using foster. So what are some ways that you can see or uplift or fill in the blank resilience in your clients? Yeah, um, I've, there've been, I like memes and there's been a lot of memes lately about resilience and how like, um, I used to love the word resilience and I still do, but there's been a meme lately circulating about like, 
resilience is overrated and, and I'd rather have like support. And it's like, let's stop patting people on the back for how many blows they can take and start like telling people to be okay with needing to like fall down sometimes and have your loved ones pick you up. You know, like, I think that we as humans are so social and I always help people remember that we're primates and we're supposed to be like picking bugs out of each other's hair all day and like getting back scratches and cuddling. And we're so, I mean, unless you really hate all that, but a lot of people like that stuff. And, um, we are very, very social people and we need each other. And so I, I, I like what Elise said about pointing out resilience and affirming resilience. I do that a ton, like, like what Elise does. And then I also help people, um, not have to be so strong all the time. Have you seen it in Kanto, the sister who has too many burros on her back? I'm like, let, you know, drop. It's a kid's movie, but it's like, don't pick up all the donkeys. Like you don't have to be strong all the time, you know? So anyway, I don't know if anyone understands that reference. <laughs> We're all going to go look it up now, right? <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Yeah. So what about resilience? Yeah, it gets shorter and shorter on the question, right? You know, just like resilience. Um. Yeah, I totally, I totally appreciate what Elise and Caitlin have already said, and I don't know how much I can add to that, but you know, it's there's something there's something about you know all queer and trans folks and folks living at these intersections that the resilience is already there, right? It's it's already there. It already exists by the time they meet me so excellent thank you i have would have a hard time to add on to what's there already said it's very much that fostering resilience is or not sorry using that word again um that that pointing out uh, the resilience the person already has and how they've actually been able to do what they've already been able to do and how it's, I tend to say in the end, usually people who transition come out at the other end, a better person because not just of the transition, but of the journey and the discoveries and the learning of yourself you have to have. So pointing those things out are just beautiful, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So this was an interesting time that we spent together. I think this there was more swearing in this time, hour and a half, than we've had in probably the last year's worth of, um, you know, interactive workshop webinar kind of thing. So thank you for bringing some, some good, <laughs> strong language. Um, you know, it's real, it's raw, which is great. Um, but thank you all. Thank you, the four of you, for being here and for sharing what your practice is like, what you think about things that we don't oftentimes talk about in this way. So I really appreciate the, the raw, honest conversation that we've had tonight. I um, also want to thank our ASL folks who are fantastic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and all of you who joined us from um, wherever you are in the country or the world and um, for being here with, with this conversation. Thanks everybody. Thank Good to see you. All. Yeah.